The Quarterly, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. Lesson 7, Colossians 1, 1 through 14, Redeemed by the Beloved Son. Like the letter to the Philippians, Colossians was written by Paul from prison, most likely from Rome in around AD 60 to 61, although Ephesus around a decade earlier is also possible. It was probably written at the same time as Philemon, since both letters mention Epaphras, the man who planted the church at Colossae, and Onesimus, the slave whose freedom is the goal of the letter to Philemon. Colossae was a city in inland Asia Minor, about 110 miles east of the coastal city of Ephesus, in an area that Paul himself does not seem to have visited. This is a reminder that the story of the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth, presented in the book of Acts, is necessarily very partial and incomplete. The gospel went to many other places in Asia and Europe, apart from those visited by Paul and his companions, often brought there by ordinary Christians, whose faithful service and sacrifices have not been recorded for us. Paul wrote to the church at Colossae because he had become aware that they were in danger of being deceived by a philosophy that replaced a central focus on faith in Christ with various other things, whether Hellenistic ideas that blended philosophy with traditional ideas of elemental spirits, or Jewish ideas that insisted on a return to keeping all the details of the Mosaic law circumcision, kosher food laws, and the calendar of weekly, monthly, and annual festivals as being necessary for salvation. In response, Paul emphasized the supremacy of Christ in all things, and his role as unique mediator between God and man. It is Christ, the exact image of God, the firstborn over all creation, who has reconciled us to God. There is no other way of salvation. Paul regularly begins his letters with a greeting, but these greetings are tailored to the need being addressed by that particular letter. To the Philippians, Paul introduced himself and Timothy as servants or slaves of Christ Jesus. Here, however, to a less familiar audience, whom he's going to warn against doctrinal error, he calls himself an apostle of Christ Jesus. This stresses his authority to teach them what is and what is not Orthodox Christian teaching. He was not appointed to that position by the decree of any human individual or committee, but rather by the will of God himself. Verse 1. You could compare Galatians 1, 16 to 24. In contrast, Timothy is here merely introduced as our brother. The letter is addressed to the saints and faithful brothers in Colossae, verse 2. The members of the Colossian church are called saints, not because they lead dramatic, otherworldly lives of near spiritual perfection, but because they have been set apart as belonging to God. In that respect, the Colossian church had the same status as Old Testament Israel, who is called a holy nation, Exodus 19.6, cited in 1 Peter 2.9. Yet unlike so many members of Israel during the Old Testament, the people at Colossae were faithful brothers. That is, they were walking by faith in God and in fellowship with Paul, believing the same gospel that he preached in the churches that he had planted. For a first century Jew to call a congregation largely made up of Gentiles brothers demonstrates a remarkable impact that has been wrought by the gospel upon Paul's thinking as we can see in Galatians 3.28. Those who had once been aliens and strangers to God, indeed, those he had once sought to persecute in his zeal for the faith of the fathers, were now his brothers and sisters in Christ, the recipients of grace and peace from God, who was their mutual father. Verse 3. Paul also regularly begins his letters by giving thanks for the Christians to whom he is writing. In this case, Paul's thanksgiving centers on the faith, love, and hope of the Colossians. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and love for other Christians, virtues that themselves sprang from the hope they had of a solid inheritance that was stored up for them in Christ in the heavenly realms. Verses 3 to 5.
For Paul, these three virtues of faith, hope and love summarize the gospel message that had been proclaimed to the Colossians and indeed around the whole world, verse 6, in line with Paul's own proclamation. In this way, Paul emphasizes the uniformity of faithful doctrine that existed amongst the early churches, from which the Colossians were in danger of being drawn away. Yet this was the doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, upon which the church had first been founded by Epaphras, a faithful fellow worker of Paul, verse 7. It may be that Epaphras himself had come to faith under Paul's ministry in Ephesus in Acts 19, and was part of the church planting movement raiding out from there, by which all the residents of Asia heard the word of Christ, Acts 19.10. In addition to the church of Colossae, Epaphras may also have planted the churches in nearby Laodicea and Hierapolis. 4.13 Paul has been faithfully praying for these churches ever since he first heard of their existence. Verse 9 This proves that his prayer for them is not merely motivated by his concern that they might drift away from the truth. On the contrary, it was because they were solidly established churches with faith, love, and hope that Paul was praying for them. Specifically, Paul prayed that the Colossians might be filled with the knowledge of God's will, not in the sense of a mystical direction that would assist them in the decision-making process in life, but in the sense that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Verse 10. Knowing God's will is meant to lead to obedient living and bearing fruit in every good work, verse 10. You could compare John 15, 5, as well as to a deeper knowledge of God himself. Contemporary Christians sometimes separate doctrine from practice, as if the latter is more important than the former, but of course the two are integrally related. You cannot have correct doctrine without it impacting your behavior, First John 4, 8. And correct practice that is isolated from orthodox doctrine is offensive to God, who wants us to know him as well as to serve him. Yet neither the knowledge of God nor the ability to serve him can come from our own power. They are themselves the gift of the Spirit. Verse 9. For this reason, Paul prays that the Lord would strengthen the Colossians with all power according to his glorious might which is the necessary prerequisite if they are to endure trials and hardships with patience and with thanksgiving, verses 11 and 12. The Colossians have much to thank God for, even if their present earthly circumstances are less than ideal. Whereas formerly a heavenly inheritance belonged to Israel alone, now the Colossians too have been included in God's holy people in the kingdom of light. Thus, the inheritance promised to Abraham now comes to those who are Abraham's offspring by virtue of sharing his faith rather than sharing his ethnicity, as Paul explains in Romans 4. Once we too were children of darkness, held captive under its thrall, but now we've been brought into the kingdom of light, whose sovereign is Jesus Christ, the beloved Son of God, verses 12 and 13. This declaration, too, picks up on Old Testament promises, first made to Israel and now applied to the church. In this case, Isaiah 9, 2 through 6. Christ is the promised son of Isaiah 9, who brought light to the people who dwelt in great darkness. God did this by redeeming his people at the cost of the son whom he loves. Verses 13 and 14. When Abraham was called to offer Isaac, the son whom he loved, a ram was provided to take his place, Genesis twenty-two thirteen. 13. But there was no substitute to take the place of Jesus, because he himself was our substitute. This concept of redemption also recalls the deliverance of Israel, the Lord's firstborn son, out of Egypt, Exodus 4, 22-23. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we receive the redemption toward which the earlier Exodus pointed forward, the forgiveness of our sins. Verse 13. Paul's thanksgiving thus shows the full-orbed nature of Christian salvation. 
it's not merely forgiveness of sins and an heavenly inheritance, although it includes both of those things. It is being brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, where we may come to know the true and living God, and where we are called to bear rich fruit in lives of obedience. All this is God's gift to us through faith, as the Spirit works within us, which gives us a solid hope for the future, love for one another, and joy and thanksgiving to God. Application Questions 1. Paul calls the Colossians faithful brothers. How do you regard the members of your church? Do you think of them as brothers and sisters? How, how do those family relationships reveal themselves? How could you function more effectively in the church as a family? 2. What does it mean for you to live a life of faith, love, and hope in your setting? 3. Do you ever pray for churches that you haven't personally been part of? How might you pray for them? 4. What is your story of having been brought from darkness into the kingdom of light? How does it connect with the larger story of redemption in the scriptures? Thank you.